I think the thing, the term I will talk about uh, is called data asymmetry. Is going to be more uh, like dry compared to, for instance, your uh, very interesting presentation and the others. Um, dry and also very uh, uh, derives from technological concepts mostly, um, not from really like barely cultural, but more, more from technological concepts. So. Um, Data asymmetry is basically a concept that I've been trying to formulate for some time based on this uh, the concept in economy called uh, information asymmetry. And I'll come to that in a very, uh, uh, in, I'll dive into it first and then come to its uh, um, say use, use cases and then uh, ways to confront uh, this type of asymmetry, which is a problem that I, I think uh, in general. Uh, so it's not a positive uh, concept, it's a very negative concept, I will, I'll come to that. Um, this was, the information asymmetry as a concept was coined by this economist, uh, George Ekerlof, in 1970. And I will not tell more about this, you can search online and find about this, but I will just use it as a reference point. Now first, um, let's discuss briefly, you know, what's the, 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 the distinction between like, what's knowledge, information, and data. This is like a typical, uh, uh, what's called knowledge pyramid, uh, that, uh, the framework for, from information science. Uh, you know, in the, in the, before data, you have this raw material, usually, you know, uh, you basically digitize this raw material. This can be a scanning of a book, a photograph of a space, you know, uh, and so on and so forth. And then once you digitize it, it becomes data, right? And then after, when you analyze data, like find patterns, you know, sort things, order data, it becomes like an information that you can start to really uh, read. Um, and, but then when you, when you interpret information, each, which it becomes something that we now call knowledge that you can, again, uh, transfer to elsewhere. And from knowledge, you can also go to the other levels, but I will not discuss that. Um, and Usually, knowledge itself uh, becomes a raw material again, especially you know when you build uh, when it's historical, for instance, when it's uh, uh, evidence and so on and so forth. Um, um, just is just to give you basic uh, uh, the basics of say the, the the almost like the ontology of information. Um, Information asymmetry is a concept uh, in economics and contract theory. Um, when one side has more or better information than the other, it, it gains power. Right? This is a very typical idea. Like imagine we are doing a contract on some whatever uh, in, in real estate or in art, doesn't matter, you know, and we can, if I know more than you or if you know more than me, you have better uh, conditions that you can really make a better deal with me. Um, you can gain power, you can gain uh, capital, and so on and so forth. A very good example is from uh, the, uh, the rise of oil industry, um, which I like to talk about a lot. Um, information asymmetry actually is something that was really a, 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 a primary driver of, of uh, the building of capital and power in the past century, like the 100 or 20, 200 almost years. Um, the industry era players, uh, they really prospered uh, during this time. Um, um, the oil industry in the 19, uh, late uh, 19th century, uh, this is a photograph from Azerbaijan, Baku. Uh, you may be familiar with the story, but basically the first, first modern oil drilling started in this land. And like, families like Noble, you know, Rothschild and stuff like that, they were all there. They, were all, they all had one of these uh, big you know, um, towers trying to find oil from this land. Um, and this is well described in this book called uh, Carbon Democracy uh, from uh, Timothy Mitchell. Um, you may know him, and he's, uh, I would really recommend this book if you haven't read before. He talks about you know, how the British, you know, the German, uh, sorry, French and the US uh, companies uh, uh, you know, tapped into these uh, regional governments and through mechanisms of mandate and uh, protectorates where they to, to, to actually you know, use this oil reserves uh, and and, and in, in return they give, you know, protect rates, let's say, from Ottoman Empire or, or mandates and so on and so forth. Um, so that means that that's the time where they know about oil, they, they know about oil drilling, they know about uh, where the oil is, the information of where the oil is, and, and they know also how to use it in their own society, like for electricity and so on and so forth. And so they, they do deals with these governments uh, in return of this information. 
just jumping from today, <laughs> or maybe like another 100 years, um, since the emergence of the internet and the web, uh, that's my argument more or less, that information has grown increasingly abundant uh, and, and far more people, as you know, like gained access to formerly enclosed knowledge and information. And this began to change the power in every field, uh, uh, the, the power imbalance in every field as we know. And, and a good analogy is usually the Encyclopedia Brit Britannica and the Wikipedia, a typical example where you have, uh, you know, if you look at the timeline, the Britannica was something that was relevant, I think, up until 2000 or something. After that moment, it's no more relevant, it's no more, uh, uh, you know, it doesn't have, con cannot contain as much as information like Wikipedia, for instance. Um, so this is one example, and we, through this type of uh, processes in every other you know, uh, uh, knowledge field, let's say, uh, people became or self-taught people, like mostly on younger generation I'm talking about, like you know, for myself as well. I, I did study in the school, but I was really a person who learned from the internet almost everything I know today. Um, so um, this, I mean, this, Again, the balance has changed in almost every field. Uh, uh, I don't really go into deep into any other disciplines and so on and so forth, but it's just a general uh, 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 view, almost like an economist view of the, the knowledge. Um, of course, as the information grows and as people have more access to information, the, this starts to really threaten the, the, uh, the, the existing power structures, obviously, in the very brief terms. Um, and, and governments, of, of course, wanted to encounter or counter this information uh, abundance issue. One way is to do is like to do apply censorship, as we all know. Um, and this is very common uh, censorship, I mean, on the internet, not on television or, 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 or printed. But on the internet, there's systematic censorship that's been applied, especially in countries like China, Turkey, and so on. This is one uh, little visualization of that like from one of the workshops I've done. And the participants made this map of uh, uh, the, the courts. The blue dots are courts, and, and there's a court order to censor a particular or block access to a particular website. Uh, and, and those green dots are different websites. There are like uh, almost hundreds and thousands of websites blocked in Turkey at the moment. Um, that's one vehicle or instrument they do the censorship itself. And the second is, uh, as you know, the net neutrality story, where you, um, the, the ISPs, the internet service providers, pay um, uh, to the, uh, well, sorry, the websites pay to the internet service providers to let their users access faster to their, to their services. Imagine this, like, for instance, Facebook uh, paying all this money to the telecom uh, in Ljubljana, you know, let's say if they are providing the internet, and in return, the, you, you access to Facebook faster than any other website you can access in Ljubljana. One example, this is called uh, violation of net neutrality. Um, this is a common practice in, uh, or it is becoming a common practice in UK, US, and uh, again, uh, European Union. And so governments and also in alignment corporations, they're trying to uh, pass this law on net neutrality so that they can actually, uh, companies can pay and so on and so forth. It's a very hyper-capitalist, I will say, censorship model. Um, so it's a very also systematic abuse of uh, power in action, you can call that. Um, the other important point here is the, the growth of data in the world. Like uh, the, the reason that the data, the amount of data grows is because the, uh, the, the electronic and software based infrastructures that we have right today, you know, it's like started years ago during the telegraph uh, era, uh, the first world, second world war. And the, all these pipes, uh, or what we call submarine cables, uh, are uh, lined under the water to connect the intercontinents, basically. And they're all these, they have different colors, as you can notice, they're all a private company who are running these uh, individual the submarine cables. There's a map uh, called, uh, there's an actually interactive map that you can search yourself. It's called submarinecablemap.com. You can have individual like details of the you know, particular lines and so on and so forth. Also, um, um, the, the, if you look at how data grows on this timeline, let's say, uh, if, as we come to you know, 2000, uh, data is no more analog. It's completely digital and always digital. It's always, it always turns into a digital material, let's say. And it also becomes uh, connected as we come to 2007. And today, it's like, that means every data point more or less has an internet address, an IP address that you can access from any other machine. 
this is not a, I mean, think about this like a, you know, like not only our devices and phones and um, laptops, but also anything that flies, every camera that you see around, you know, every microphone is almost, you can connect to the internet. Um, so these are, as you all know, they are data capture tools like, or devices around us. Um, so, um, because of, I think, these, these multiple reasons, uh, uh, the, 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 uh, the abundance of information uh, and, and data, like the power and capital had to find a new space uh, for itself. Like in a way, um, mm, I, I'd say like the role of information as metric in the past to build power and capital almost is being replaced by data as metric. I'll go in more in detail about what I mean with this. Um, and that means that also today, those who can uh, aggregate and you know, capture data and, and, and hedge it, like you know, control it in some uh, ways, uh, can actually start building new power and capital, obviously. And we all know, actually, I mean, we are familiar with this story, I, I, I assume, mostly, uh, that you know, if from all our, it's not just Facebook and Twitter, this and that, but also in the everyday life, our activities are being captured, measured, you know, turned into metadata. They are linked to one another, um, and they, are, they turn become into this what we call graph, the giant network of data. Uh, and, and, and usually, when you have a, um, a network of data, which is called technically graph, it becomes uh, um, um, it, it, it becomes a, a, a corpus that can tell more than its, uh, some of its parts. Like it's, uh, it's actually an intelligence itself. So um, we, are, we are familiar with this story a bit from like things like, uh, like popular culture, like person of interest, these movies and so on and so forth, where, you, where the police is after some whatever suspicious person. They want to you know, uh, find out who this person is and his connections and so on. And this is all done through the same technology, same uh, infrastructures. We, we are already living in it. Um, um, and, and the, in this whole story, the graph itself, the network diagram, uh, emerges as one particular mode of understanding the situation. And when data points link to one another, again, like the whole generates better intelligence and more value than some of its parts. Um, you know, maybe you've, heard, you've seen this visualization before. This is uh, the, they say, people on Facebook uh, around the world and how they connected to each other. So different continents, different cities connect to each other in this uh, little diagram. Um, and this is called social graph in the Facebooks and the, the lingo, let's say. And we know also there's Google that we search every day all the time. Uh, Google has this other uh, type of, uh, almost like the same structure, but uh, about knowledge in, ge in general. Not just people's relationships, but how things connect to each other, like, like in Wikipedia, for instance. They call this knowledge graph. Um, there's also other things like if you use uh, a music program called Spotify, there you also listen, you know, different types of music uh, pieces, MP3s, whatever. And as you listen them, you make connections between music pieces because you listen multiple of them. And this is also called a uh, music graph. So it goes like that. There are more of these examples. There's fashion graph, there's more general interest graph, this and that. Um, and also there's this, I want to just insert one advertisement here. <laughs> Um, the, the term cloud is a, like a, it's not related directly to what we talk about here, but the, the cloud is one thing that, that is um, used like a, a, almost like ideological term, I will say, um, and to, to say that, you know, your data is safe in the clouds, uh, for instance, you know, said to all of us, but actually it's not, there's no cloud, it's just other people's computers. And this is a nice diagram or image from Free, uh, uh, Free Software Foundation. So graphs in general are used to make uh, algorithmic predictions as well and optimizations about our future activities. Like, you know, as our behavior systematically forecasted, uh, we have gradually entered into a, you know, what you call society of control that monitors and simul uh, simulates and also premediates our individual identities in relation to our own data, data trails. Um, so um, the... I would say that you know, the systematic abuse of power, uh, you can call it like bluntly oppressive or you know, subtly hypocrite, um, uh, has to be confronted in a systematic way um, through a systematic struggle, I think. So that's why I've been uh, working in this area for quite some time, and I will show you maybe one or two examples and then finish the, uh, this presentation.
because data asymmetry is something, it's a, it's a problem itself, but the way to um, uh, co uh, confront this is also uh, very difficult, and it has to be systematic at some point. So there are some ways, I think, and there are other, uh, uh, other roles possible, obviously. So you can, uh, you know, we can barely, uh, 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 so we can move away from being a, a bare subject of data collection and become active uh, subjects or active agents of, of the, the, the investigator itself, right? We can be investigators about the, uh, say, the perpetrators of our, the issues that matters to us. This can be con uh, you know, conflict, this can be, say, some uh, uh, corruption issue and so on and so forth. Uh, I'll give, show you some examples. So, and, but one way to do this is that to, to be able to connect, uh, it's like, almost like in solidarity, connect your data to each other about the issue that you're focusing on. So this is one little sketch I've, I've done earlier about to describe this idea that you can, you may have, I have some knowledge, you have some knowledge, or I have some data, you have some data, and if you kind of find some, some, find some connections in between, then we can start really seeing a bigger picture together. That's the main idea. I'll show you how it, we've, I, we've been doing this in different projects. One example is uh, something called Networks of Dispossession. Uh, it's a, a collective data compiling and mapping project on the relations of capital and power in the, within the urban transformation in Turkey. Uh, it started like that, it became more a general uh, project uh, about includes energy and so on and so forth. Um, so um, what, what we've done is like in, during the Gezi uprising, uh, we were uh, on the 6th of June 2013 in the park, uh, made, made an open call, a, a workshop basically, and then with people who, are, who just came there, we started discussing the possible actors and relationship types that we can find um, uh, about the urban transformation projects, because we thought that this is the main source of the, well, how the government builds capital, but at the same time how um, uh, uh, they, they suppress the, the, the political actions in general. Uh, so some people, it was mostly like the mix of uh, lawyers, artists, let's say social scientists, engineers, um, uh, designers, and, and, and so on, and journalists as well. Uh, and also some people, they want to remain anonymous, obviously. Um, so we did two, two main things, very basically. First, ask this question, like, what is the most important actor in this field that we're looking at? Uh, these are, you know, government organizations, holding companies, contractor companies, uh, media companies, uh, uh, board members of these companies, they are uh, minister of, the, of some institution in the government, and so on. Also, we looked at what are the relas critical relations, relationship types between these uh, uh, actors. Like the, a, a company basically does a contract with the government institution on whatever project, right? And, and a company is a partnership in partnership with another company. Uh, they are a member of a whatever association and so on. Then we started compiling this data from different sources, from news articles, government databases, the company websites itself as a reference, Wikipedia, and so on. Um, as a result, we built these, um, you know, uh, three different models, I would say, where uh, on one of them we uh, have the, the um, yeah, you can see, see this here, like the projects of dispossession, we called it at first, and then the second map is like the the partnerships of dispossession, and finally dispossessed minorities in Turkey, which are the uh, non-Muslim uh, minorities, like, you know, Bulgarians, uh, you know, Romans, also uh, Armenians and Greeks and so on and so forth. And they are like, co their properties are taken forcefully by the government in historically, basically. Um, so from this map, you start seeing, like, uh, from this data model, you start, when you fill with actual research, you start seeing this type of uh, diagram. This is one little capture from a very large map. And uh, we, because these maps are also very hard to read, uh, because there's so much information and data in front of you. Um, and what we do is that we use these logos of these uh, media companies uh, to, to let the viewer to start reading these maps. Uh, these logos are quite familiar for the general public. You know, they are like the, the top uh, uh, media outlets. Uh, Hurriyet is the top newspaper. CNN Turk on top is the, uh, is the CNN branch. There's NTV, CNBC, and so on and so forth. They, they, as you can see, they are owned by a holding company, two different holding companies, Doğan and Doğuş. And they, Doğan and Doğuş together, are in, a, in partner in a project called Aslancak Hes. Hes is a hydroelectric uh, power plant uh, that means uh, this possession of water. Um, and then they are in partner in this project together, and they also run the top 
you know, uh, media, media companies. That means when there's a problem on uh, this Aslan Jikhez construction site, for instance, when a labor, you know, uh, uh, a, a worker may be killed, um, there's no news about it on these media. This is clear, right? This is one example. There are many other ways of, you know, um, the power operates here. Also, we looked at the top, uh, I would say, the, uh, the richest, let's say, the act, uh, actors in Turkey, like this guy, Ahmet Çelik, is one of them. He's all of these blue dot, dot uh, text is the company names of he owns, and he's in uh, partner with all the other names that are around him. With a diagram like this, you can start really navigating the, the power uh, relationships uh, exist in Turkey. Um, that's another example. I'll go quickly. And, and one thing I would say is that um, this type of uh, method of showing this data in this format uh, really helped to the general public to make uh, to to build sentences out of these diagrams. This is this works very well in Turkish, but not so well in English uh, because of the language structure. But uh, in Turkish, you can start reading from one dot and just connect relationships, and you you can build a sentence and almost like infinite, uh, never-ending sentences through a path. Um, but basically, you see the, the Tarlabaşı project, which is an urban transformation project, uh, is uh, basically built by this Gap Inşaat, Gap Construction uh, Company, who's owned by Çalık Holding, who owns other media channels. And the same company also does, uh, you know, whatever Sheikh Rizal Konaklar is another, another project there. And also that project is given to, the contract is given to them by this Toki project, which is a public housing project of Turkey, and so on and so forth. Once you represent these uh, relationships of data in this format, it becomes something very tangible. People start to really point to them. These are things that are normally invisible to us. You know, they can only think about it. Maybe you have some idea of it, but you cannot really point to it, to it easily. And by having these type of you know, prints, multiple, uh, I would say, like media, like this is touch screen, for instance, uh, people start really playing with this, these relationships and they, they really develop an understanding over time. There's also a website for this where people can check this out and so on and so forth. They, they uh, post it online and so on and, and also they create this discussion, the, the social media in general, which helps uh, to disseminate, disseminate these type of information to the public. And of course, no need to say, none of this information is available in the public news and, and none of it is available uh, or discussed in the public realm, aside from alternative channels. Um, maybe I'll just jump to the last thing and then I'll finish. Um, I'll just skip some of these stuff here. Um, so there's, uh, um, um, so I'm also a technology programmer, developer, and I, I design uh, uh, systems. So one thing is called Graph Commons. GraphCommons.com uh, is a website where we actually organize most, most of this data work. Uh, it's a collaborative mapping uh, uh, platform, basically. And many, it's used by many different organizations, um, like cultural, civic, I would say, activists, or journalists, or just researchers, and so on and so forth. Um, I'll just pass this. And uh, from this, we also make uh, people make maps and embed to their own news channels, make prints. You know, this was a, as one example. It was on the the the, the cover of a very important uh, alternative uh, news uh, uh, paper. Instar is a foundation. It's a corrupt foundation in Turkey, and they, this is their ownership diagram. Their circles of power around them, basically. Um, and finally, and last project I will switch here, it's this is the, uh, the map of uh, Syrian r refugees and the NGOs who are helping them in Turkey. This is done on this platform, done, created by a, a journalist, an investigative journalist in Turkey. He just did the research and made this map together and then we, you can see like in which city, in which camp, uh, which NGO is helping to which uh, uh, container, you know, city and so on and so forth. And where is UN here? And you can do all this type of searches and so on. Yeah, so I, in general, I think of these as like a ways to confront data asymmetry because data is usually collected about us, you know, and on, in all these systems that we use. But in this way, you can, as a, you know, active organization, a civic uh, uh, group, you can start building your own data about the issues that matters, matters to you. And then that, I think, is, has a very important um, uh, element of struggle. Okay.